In the gospel, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and mine know me. They hear my voice and they follow. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Church history tells us that the early Christians had a special love, a special attraction for the image of Jesus as the good shepherd. Their artists put it everywhere, in their churches, in their homes, at their grave sites, on their tombs, on the walls of the catacombs, paintings and icons, statues and murals. And that was because the image of the Good Shepherd always reminded suffering, persecuted Christians that God was always present to them. God loved them, cared for them, guided them at every moment of their lives, especially in times of trial, times of persecution. So the image of the Good Shepherd, we say, is linked, it is inseparably linked to the reality of divine providence mysterious working of God who makes all things work together for the good of those who love him. The loving, merciful God who changes and guides and directs the course of events in our lives, arranges things for our happiness as we follow him. Now, the Old Testament is full of symbolic imagery of God as the good shepherd of his people. Most well known, of course, is the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Even though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are at my side with your rod and your staff that give me courage. We could think of the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, where it says, like a shepherd he feeds his flock and gathers the lambs in his arms. In Isaiah chapter 53, uh, the oracle of Christ, the suffering servant, it says, we had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way, but the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. The prophet Zechariah, foretelling our Lord's passion, said, strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. You remember that some of the great figures of the Old Testament were shepherds actual shepherds at some point in their lives. You could think of uh, Jacob shepherding the flock of his father Isaac while his brother Esau went out to do the hunting. Jacob was the shepherd who became patriarch. We could think of Moses shepherding the flock of his father-in-law Jethro at Mount Sinai. Moses was the shepherd who became leader and lawgiver at God's people in the Old Testament. There was David tending the flocks of his father Jesse, the shepherd who became king. We could think of Amos, who was called the shepherd of Tekoa, the shepherd who became prophet. Over the centuries, they all pointed the way to Jesus Christ, the good shepherd who tends the spiritual sheep of God the Father in heaven as priest, prophet, and king. In the Bible, of course, uh, we also find the imagery of the bad shepherds, like the bad kings, the evil kings of Israel, were way more bad ones than there were good ones. There were the unfaithful priests, the scribes, and the Pharisees. To the prophet Ezekiel, God said, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves and not my flock. To Jeremiah, God said, my sheep are scattered, and their own shepherds scatter them. And in the gospel, of course, uh, there is the ultimate example of the wolf in sheep's clothing in the story of Judas. Now, I don't know about the other priests, but everywhere that I go, I meet the lay people who still agonize over the priest's scandals. And no matter what you may hear to the contrary, the fact is that it is still at the forefront of the minds of many of our people. Many of our people will tell me that they are still confused and angry and they're looking for answers. And a lot of the time they feel like they're not getting them. They ask me about the scandals. Sometimes all that I can do is to try to refer them back 
to the facts of salvation history. I say, let me ask you something. Think about this. Of all the good, holy, devout, saintly men our Lord could have chosen to be the twelfth apostle, why would he choose a bum like Judas? We know why. It's not hard to figure out. Our Lord left us Judas as a warning. We will have to live with scandals in the church. Our Lord warned us there would be wolves in the sheepfold, there would be wolves in sheep's clothing, and if there's anything worse, and I mean much worse, than a wolf in sheep's clothing, it is a wolf in shepherd's clothing. There are good shepherds and there are bad shepherds. This is common sense. It's the way that life is. And really, it is a reflection of what goes on in the natural order. If you take a drive in the country, in most parts of America, chances are you're going to see herds of cattle, lots of cattle. But those of us who have been in Australia uh, know that when you drive through the countryside there, chances are you're going to see way more flocks of sheep than herds of cattle. Sheep herding is a big business in Australia. Father George Rutler tells a story of a priest he knows in Australia who was teaching catechism to a group of kids at a sheep station, and the fathers were all shepherds, and uh, the priest was trying to t teach the kids about Jesus as the good shepherd. And he asked them the question, what would your father do if he had a hundred sheep and one of them wandered off away from the flock and got lost and was left out in the wind and the rain and the cold and in danger from wolves and all kinds of predators, what would your father do? One boy raised his hand and said, I know what my old man would do. He'd let the little bugger go. The old man would leave him for the dingoes. Uh, the dingo is the Australian cousin of the coyote. Again, the point that I'm making is not every shepherd is a good shepherd. I know a pastor who went on a pilgrimage in the Holy Land as part of a tour group, and at one point in their trip, the tour bus they were riding in had to stop and wait because there was a big flock of sheep uh, in the middle of the road, and there were these Palestinian shepherds driving the flock of sheep across the road, but he noticed that there was one little lamb still on the other side, starting to wander off in the opposite direction. And he wanted to see what the shepherds would do with that little lamb. Uh, he thought that he would see a little of the gospel in action. He thought he would see uh, the shepherd walk over to the lamb pick him up, carry him in his arms, carry him across the road back with the rest of the flock. Well, that's not what happened. The shepherd came up to that little lamb and he kicked it. And he kicked it hard. And he kept on kicking it. He kicked it all the way across the road until it got back with the rest of the flock. So again, uh, not every shepherd has a genuine love and concern for the sheep. In St. John's Gospel, Jesus warned us against the false shepherds. He said there would be false teachers who would lead the flock astray. There would be thieves and marauders who would try to steal the sheep. There would be hired hands, he called them hirelings, who would run off when they saw the wolves coming. The cowards who would run off and leave the flock to be torn apart. And uh, it seems to me that the gospel imagery of the good shepherd versus the hireling has never been more relevant than it is right now. And it is the business of every Catholic. St. John Eudes was a great mission preacher of the 17th century, the great apostle of Eucharistic adoration. But he wrote a lot about the state of the church and Catholics in his day in Europe but he once said this, the most sure sign that God is thoroughly angry with his people is when he allows them to fall into the hands of a corrupt clergy. Now I'll give you the whole quotation here. 
<laughs> of course, it is highly politically incorrect. Um, and uh, chances are you'll never hear it again, so I'll give it to you for what it is worth. St. John Eudes said this, quote, the most evident mark of God's anger the most terrible castigation he can inflict upon the world is manifest when he permits his people to fall into the hands of a clergy who are more in name than in deed. Priests who practice the cruelty of ravening wolves rather than the charity and affection of devoted shepherds. When God permits such things, it is a very positive proof that he is thoroughly angry with his people and is visiting his most dreadful wrath upon them." End quote. Now, I'll make no judgment about that. I leave it to all of you to draw your own conclusions from that. I'll be kind of like the uh, cable news channel that says, we report, you decide. Hmm? Now, some years ago, Catholic writer George Weigel wrote a book about the pre-scandals in the church, and the book was entitled The Courage to be Catholic. And his premise in the book was that the crisis we face in the church today is, in his words, primarily a crisis of Episcopal authority, a failure of Episcopal leadership, that is, the failure of so many bishops who are not good shepherds, not true shepherds after the mind and heart of Jesus Christ, but are, uh, in reality, false shepherds. Hirelings who ran away when the wolves closed in, and then worse than that, covered up for the wolves after the damage had been done. The ones who seemed to be more concerned with protecting the wolves than the sheep. The whole church has suffered in recent years because of the men who see the sacred office, the office of bishop, as nothing more than a job, a career like any other. They see themselves not as shepherds over God's flock, not as true successors of the apostles, but as mere administrators, functionaries, bureaucrats, who ran their dioceses more like corporate CEOs than shepherds of souls. We're going to answer to Christ himself. In years gone by, how many of them uh, just gave the wolves a free pass? Wolves teaching false doctrine, wolves teaching dissent, heresy, wolves causing scandal and sexual abuse. How many of them just turned a blind eye to it all and looked the other way? Too many. One is too many. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't misunderstand me. I don't want this to sound like an indictment of all of our bishops. It is not. In fact, I would say to you, there are far, far more good shepherds among them than there are bad shepherds. But the problem is, it is the bad shepherds that get 90% of the attention, the publicity. I always say, one bad priest is too many. One bad bishop is too many. Mm? And I've said this before here, and for the benefit of the people who may be listening to this via live stream, I'll say it again. You got to keep all this stuff about the scandals in perspective. Remember, of the roughly 50,000 priests in this country, 96% of them had nothing to do with these scandals. And the vast majority of the bishops who are now in office had nothing to do with the cover-ups. But you're not going to hear that from the secular media because scandal sells. Fidelity doesn't sell. The good shepherds, well, typically the secular media doesn't even know they are alive. It wouldn't give them the time of day, and we all know that. Obviously, years gone by, there have been many false shepherds in the church. They presented a real dilemma, a crisis of faith for many good Catholics, and the problem is this. How can we know who they are? How can we tell them apart? 
if we don't find out the hard way from the secular media? How can we tell the good shepherds from the bad shepherds, the true teachers of the faith from the false ones? It is really not that hard to do most of the time. If you hear something taught about the faith that doesn't sound right to you, most of the time, all you have to do is consult with the catechism of the Catholic Church. Refer to the magisterium, the teaching office of the church. If you do that, you will never go wrong. Now, some years ago, there was a classic example of this when a network news program, ABC 2020, got permission from the Archdiocese of New York to film an exorcism, an actual exorcism in progress. And when they did that, I remember there was a big uproar, great controversy everywhere among Catholics. And after that show, uh, ABC brought on two commentators, two priests. One was a priest of the Archdiocese of New York, an expert in supernatural phenomena in the occult late Father James Labar, and the other one, the other priest, was a well-known theologian from Notre Dame, the late Father Richard P. McBrien. The two priests directly contradicted each other, and the interview turned into a debate. The theologian, McBrien, said that everything everybody had just seen was a fake, and that exorcisms are a fraud. He said there's no such thing as demonic possession. He said that Satan doesn't exist. And belief in the devil and hell, well, all that is just a bunch of medieval superstition. The other priest said exactly the opposite. Now, I remember for weeks after that program, people were coming to us priests asking us about what they had heard on that show. Very confused. People wanted to know which one of those priests were they supposed to listen to? Which one was right? Which one was wrong? Which one was the true teacher of the faith? Which was the false one? Well, anybody who's read the Gospel or the Catechism knows the answer to that question. But the answers are not always so clear. You see, the existence of the devil in hell this is a defined article of our Catholic faith to deny that is heresy. Again, the answers are not always so clear as that, so our Lord gave us a very definite way to know the truth. Christ, the Good Shepherd, never left his flock in darkness. He left us all the facts, all the evidence we need to be able to recognize the truth, the true faith. At the Last Supper, our Lord promised that the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the spirit of truth, the guarantor of truth, the soul of the mystical body of Christ would lead and guide his apostolic church, his apostolic union in the fullness of truth, in all truth, until the end of time. Otherwise, how do you explain the fact that the doctrinal and moral teaching of the Catholic Church, and only the Catholic Church, has never changed? That should make sense to you. If a truth, a dogma, is revealed by God, then it cannot change. Precisely because God does not change, the truth does not change, God is the truth. Jesus said, I know my sheep and mine know me. He recognized my voice and they follow. On earth, his living voice is the Catholic Church. The Church he endowed with the fullness of divinely revealed truth and all the means of salvation. In so many places, we have found Catholics who uh, have felt in recent years like they have been sheep without shepherds. Catholics who long to hear the fullness of the truth of our faith and they feel like they haven't gotten it. They want to follow good shepherds and they are sick and tired of the false ones. 
Yeah, there are the false shepherds who obviously don't believe what the church teaches, but there are also the false shepherds who simply keep their mouths shut in the face of what they know is wrong. I have known some priests who seem to be um, solid enough and they always would seem to talk a good fight in private conversation. But when they got into the pulpit, it was like there was this sudden dramatic drop in their testosterone levels. Something happened. They're afraid to speak out against sin, to speak out against the great moral evils of our time and to take on the culture of death. The ones who are far more concerned about their own popularity and their own acceptance and the salvation of the souls entrusted to them. They are the false shepherds also. Make no mistake. All of us need to pray that the Holy Spirit will send more, many more good shepherds to lead his people through the dangerous and difficult days that we are living in. God gave us one church, one faith, one Lord, one flock, and one shepherd. Jesus Christ is the true shepherd, the good shepherd, who never leaves his flock untended.